Our Father in heaven, we pray that you will illumine your word as it's read and as it's taught. We pray that you'll open our hearts uh, to receive your word, that it would not fall upon hard soil or be choked out by worldly concerns. And we pray rather that our hearts would be open and receptive. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. It's the 126th sermon in a series that began in Genesis chapter 1 as we are going through the Old Testament narratives. Chapters 4 through 6 are a series of miracles in connection with the ministry of, of Elisha. And I'm entitling this sermon, Messianic Miracles. And the next couple of uh, sermons will have the same title because while these miracles tell us about Elisha, that he's the true prophet of God, that he's a man of God, and while they tell us about God, as Elisha is the agent of God's revelation, that even more so they tell us about Christ. Elisha foreshadows Christ in these miracles that, that he performs. And it was Jesus that, that taught us in Luke 24 that, that uh, the truth about himself was to be found in all the scriptures. There is a, a true sense in which all of the Bible is a revelation of Christ. Uh, Jesus said the same thing, in effect, in John 5 when he said, Moses wrote of me in answer to some of his detractors. You want to know what the law of God is about? You want to know what the Mosaic books, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy, are are about? Well, well, Jesus says Moses was writing about him. Uh, There's a a properly Christ-centered understanding of the Bible. In Acts 3, uh, 24, uh, there the apostle Peter said that all of the prophets from Samuel to his successors on announced these days. That is, the days of the life and ministry of Christ. And so I think it's right and proper to understand that the the miracles of Elisha are messianic miracles. They reveal God's work. They reveal Christ's love. They reveal Christ's concerns as foreshadowed in Elisha, who is a type of Christ and who anticipates the Messiah, the final prophet of God. So that's, I think, the right framework from which to understand the passages that we'll be looking at. And all that we'll have time for this evening is the first of these miracles in in verses 1 through 7, uh, having to do with the widow's debts. So we'll be looking then at the first four verses of 2 Kings chapter 4. And then in successive weeks, we'll go on to look at the Shunammite son in verses 18 through 37 and uh, the miracles that uh, follow in in succeeding chapters. So let's look uh, first at this widow's desperate situation. Verse 1, it says, Now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. Now, this woman identifies herself as one who has been widowed. Her husband, she says, was one of the sons of the prophet, prophets, that is part of the prophetic circle or guild or association in Old Testament Israel. Uh, She identifies him as your servant. He's a servant of God. And she says, you know that your servant feared the Lord. So he was a son of the prophet. He is your servant, like Elisha is your servant, and he feared the Lord. And what's the situation? Well, the situation is he's dead. And she's got two sons. And she has no husband uh, to help her to rear those sons. And she's in desperate situation. A widow in ancient times would have no means of supporting herself. And so she is in considerable uh, trouble. Uh, She is in a distressing situation. She is... Uh, to the point of despair. And so verse 1 goes on 
and says, and you know that your servant feared the Lord and the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. It was possible for one to sell uh, or in effect really to hire out uh, one of one's children in order to pay your debts and uh, fellow citizens of Israel could be indentured servants for a period of seven years. And she would have few alternatives as a, as a widow. She would have no means of supporting herself. Uh, she is pointing out that she is faithful and continuing to serve God at a very difficult time and that her husband served God at a very difficult time. This is, this is the period of Elijah and Elisha. This is the period of Ahab. This is the period in which Baalism has made such progress in Israel. This is, this is a period in which, even at the least, uh, there has been considerable syncretism and, and compromise of, of, true, of the, the true religion as God revealed it through Moses and, and through the prophets. And so it's a time of persecution of those who are faithful, and it's a time of intense pressure for those who are seeking to be faithful. And, and she's pointing out in her desperation, look, my husband was a faithful man. We have tried to be a faithful household. We have tried to be a, a, faithful, uh, a, a faithful couple. And yet we find ourselves in, in this very difficult situation. And this is not an unusual thing to happen. We have to recognize in, in the history of the people of God and we're going to see this again with the Shunammite woman, and we'll see it again and over and over in all of the Bible, that often those who are faithful servants of God suffer. They find themselves in desperate situations. And the, the myth is exploded that if I do things right and if I serve God, then I'm going to prosper. Things will go well for me. That just is simply is not the case in terms of this world. Yes, your husband was a son of the prophet. Yes, your husband was a servant of God. Yes, he feared the Lord. And yes, he's died and you're widowed and your sons are on the verge of being sold into slavery in order to pay off your debts. And how is it that, that you, as faithful ones, find yourself in this situation? Well, that's the way it often ha happens. This is what happens in this world. We live in a fallen world, and the promises of God are not fully realized until the next world. And consequently, their, their faces, the people of God, a great deal of trouble. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. And so that's, that's the situation that, that this widow finds herself in. And so what does she do when she's in trouble? She cries out to Elisha. She goes to a prophet of God. In other words... Through Elisha, she is crying out to God. She's going to the right source. She's going to the right place. But she shouldn't and we shouldn't go about life naively thinking that if I do right things, all will go right for me. And I guess we have labored that point in this church. I guess it's, um, it's a message that I don't need to repeat, except that I know that it is. I know that it is a message that bears repeating. And I know that it is because I hear it all the time. I hear it on the verge of operations. I hear it um, when crises come. I hear people say that we are trusting the Lord and, and meaning by that, that therefore they're going to come through the illness the cancer is going to recede. It's going to be successfully surgically removed. Things are going to go well. We will be happy. God is going to bless because we have been faithful and we have been praying and we have been in church and we are committed Christians and we are loyal disciples of Christ and therefore things are going to go well, are they not? And uh, the... the Example that we have before us is, no, they, they not, there's, no, there's no guarantee that they will. 
All of the promises of God are fulfilled in Christ and fully realized only in the next world. In the meantime, Christians get martyred for heaven's sakes. You think you won't get sick? You think there won't be accidents? Christians get martyred. They get put to death. They have ever since the first century. They are, they are, they are um, losing their lives even as we speak in certain parts of, of the world. Yes, in this world, you will have tribulation. Job said, man is born for trouble as the sparks fly upward. What are we to do? Well, we're to know that that's the case. And that's not a sign of God's uh, faithlessness. It's not a, a sign that, that uh, God doesn't care. That's not a sign that God is impotent and weak and can't respond uh, to our cries. No, it's just a sign that uh, God is not subject to our plans. He's not obligated himself to fulfill our dreams. We don't have any guarantee that things are going to go in the direction that we would like. Uh, the Apostle Paul says his ways are inscrutable. They're, they're past finding out. His, Isaiah says his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so this, uh, this faithful woman who cries out to the Lord, who was married to a faithful man who was a son of the prophet, a servant of God who feared the Lord at a difficult time and who had remained loyal and faithful, even though there were tremendous pressures being brought upon the prophets of God through Ahab and Jezebel and the prophets of Baal and all of the compromise and syncretism and idolatry in Israel at the time. Nevertheless, she finds herself in this situation and what does she do? She does what we all should do, however low we get, uh, however desperate our situation may be, and however degraded we may be. Uh, the right thing to do is to cry out to God, knowing that, that God will, will hear our cries. Sh sure is lucky, uh, you might say, that the God to whom she is crying is the God of the widow's and of the, the fatherless, and of the orphans, and of the poor, and of the weak, and of tax gatherers, and sinners, and of shepherds. You ever thought about that, the announcement of the birth of Christ to shepherds? Despised, uh, lowly shepherds are the ones who are treated to the angelic choir announcing the birth of the Messiah. That performance wasn't given uh, in the palace. The performance wasn't given in the temple. It was given to shepherds watching sheep out in the middle of the field where no one would see it and no one would hear it expect, except these lowly, despised ones uh, of all the earth. So it sure is lucky, you might say, that she cries out to Elijah and to the God of Elijah, who is a God who promises to hear the cries of the widow and of the orphan and of the childless. So verse 1 reveals to us the desperation of this widow. Then verses 2 through 6, we see the method that God uses to address her needs. And what, what he uses is this, very simply, what she has. Let's look at these verses. No, no, what he doesn't do, what he doesn't do is he doesn't zap her with what she needs. Uh, God doesn't just snap his fingers and all that she requires is then set before her. That's not the process that he uses. It's not the procedure that he uses. What, what does he use? He used what she has. So looking at verse 2. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house except a, that is, a single jar of oil. All right, that's another, that's another insight into her desperation. She's down to nothing. She is down to one jar of oil. Once that oil runs out, she has nothing left but a jar, an empty jar. 
and then she has nowhere to turn. She's, well, she's, uh, she's on her last legs. She has run out of all the resources that she has. So, verse 3, then he said, go borrow vessels at large for yourself from all your, your neighbors, even empty vessels, and do not get a few. He starts with what she has. He starts with a single jar of oil. And he says, now go out and get, uh, get a number of different jars, empty jars from all of your neighbors. Verse 4, and you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out into all these vessels and you shall set aside what is full. And she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons and they were bringing the vessels to her and she poured. And it came about that when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not one vessel more. And the oil stopped. What God was pleased to do was to take what the woman had, the single jar of oil, from that jar to then pour the wealth of oil that could be contained in all the jars of her neighbors. And notice the emphasis upon her obedience. She's told what to do. She does it. He says to her in verse 4, um, you, you, you shall go and pour out into all these vessels and you shall set aside what is full. And so she went. And she does exactly as she's told. And she, she shuts the door uh, doing exactly what she's required to do. And God supplies all that she needs as she obeys. Notice, too, that she's told to, to, to close the door. Uh, what, what happens is to be done quietly and in a hidden way, and it's to be unseen. There's no fanfare, no publicity, nothing spectacular about it. And what I would propose is that, that this is uh, the, the way that God regularly does things. That regularly... The work of God is not done in an external, showy, spectacular kind of way. It's what makes me distressed and uncomfortable about the showiness of much of church life today, particularly the brand of it that you see on television. When God is at work, it's usually fairly quiet. You know that story about Martin Lloyd-Jones, about uh, saying, especially when he would come to America and would preach to certain congregations and he would say, you know, good evening, and they would say, amen, the big chorus of amen. He'd say, we're going to sing hymn number 125. Big chorus of amen would ring out, and everything that he said, everybody was amening. And he, he, he found, though, that as he began to preach and God began to work and a sense of conviction began to settle over the congregation, the sign that God was at work was, you guessed it, they would, they would be quiet. They quit their amen and they would sit there quietly under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Typically, when God works, it's out there with the shepherds. Typically, when God is at work, it's with Gentile, pagan, magi in a far off and distant place. Typically, when God is at work, it's in a quiet way and in a hidden way and in an unspectacular way. And... He is making use of ordinary things, ordinary people, ordinary gifts, earthen vessels. Perhaps the Apostle Paul had that in mind when he made reference to us with that language. We're but earthen vessels. That's what God uses, clay jars, clay pots, regular people. Francis Schaeffer wrote a book a number of years ago entitled No Little People, No Little Places. I love that book. I read it when I was an undergraduate. And he makes the point that in the kingdom of God, there really aren't any little people. And there aren't really any little places. God doesn't have any particular preference for grand places or for important public people. He's often working, as he did with Francis Schaeffer, on a hillside out in Switzerland somewhere, apart from the crowd, apart from the the big city, apart from public notice, quietly and in a hidden way, using what we have. We, we don't have everything here at, at uh, Independent Presbyterian. We have a lot. I think we have a lot. 
we have this beautiful facility, uh, incomparably beautiful, I would say. And that's a tremendous resource that we have. There's a lot of resources we don't have. But God will use what we have. He's not going to hold us accountable for what we don't have. He does expect us to use what we have. I'm thoroughly convinced of that. That we need to, to use what we've been given and not fail to make use of the gifts of God. But he's not going to expect us to, to do that which he hasn't equipped us to do. So we don't have everything here. We do have some things. And what we have, we're meant to use. And I think that that's true for every single one of us, as it is true for this widow. She, what's she got? She's got a, a, a jar of oil. Well, that's all it takes in terms of the kingdom of God. That's enough. God will use that. It's like the, the, when Jesus fed the, the 5,000, there was a little boy there with a couple of fish and a loaf or two. And uh, the little boy gave them to Jesus, and Jesus multiplied them. That's what he used. Again, Jesus could have just uh, lightning bolted, as it were, zapped a meal for everyone and, and multiplied and the, the loaves and fish and made them instantly appear in mass without using any human agency. But I would argue that there's, there's something to, to be learned from the fact that there was a boy there who had some fish and had some loaves, and Jesus took those. And from them, he multiplied. He didn't just snap his finger and create them by fiat. He would determine to use someone and their gifts, however small they might be, and work through that person. And I think, again, that, that we learn something about the way that God works, and we, we learn something in particular about the way that Christ works in his church. What he wants from us is that we be available. Is, is there any one of us that doesn't have gifts? In some measure? I was thinking of that while preaching this morning. You know, work is a good thing. It occurred to me at the end of the service that, you know, we don't all have the same capacities for work. We don't have, all have the same abilities in our work. We're not all equally as smart, as capable, as gifted. What does God expect of us? He expects us to be available and to do our duty and to, and to use whatever measure of, of giftedness that we have and whatever abilities that we have to use those gifts, use those abilities, maximize them, develop them to the glory of God. Why? Because that's what God does. He uses what we have. He uses the boys' loaves and fishes. He uses the woman's clay jar with a little bit of oil that was in it. And he uses us as we're available, not expecting from us that which we are not capable of doing, but content to use whatever capacities, whatever gifts, whatever resources, whatever abilities that we have. To start from there and to use those gifts and abilities and resources and multiply them and use them uh, to bring honor and glory to himself. And that, that means of every one of us that, that, that there's a way that we go through life then, doesn't it? It means that we're going through life thinking about how is it that I can serve God given who I am and where I am and what I have? How can I use the circumstances that he's brought to bear in my life? How can, how can I use the mental capacities? How can I use the physical health and strength that he has, he has given to me? How can I use the opportunities that have been presented to me? How can I use the training that, that I have been given? How can I use the financial resources that are at my disposal? God doesn't expect us to be what we're not, but he, he does want us to offer to him what we have at whatever measure it's been given to us, and to use that, because he wants to use it, and to use those things, and to work through us. Jesus said, I think in a very clarifying moment, uh, said, look, to those who didn't want the, the people to cheer as he was coming into Jerusalem, uh, at the time of his 
triumphal entry. He said, look, if they, these folks don't cheer, the stones will cry out. And in another place uh, uh, says uh, that God can raise up uh, sons of Abraham from these stones. I mean, God can do what he wants to do at any point, at any time, through any means. But the fact is, what he typically does is he works through us. And he takes what we have. And typically the people that he, that he is using are not the people with the great gifts. They're little people in little places. Here's some widow, off in some obscure corner of the world, who cries out to God through Elisha. And God is pleased to hear that cry. And then in verse 7, we see God's bounty. Verse 7 says, Then she came. And told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons shall live on the rest. And you see, he, she did what she was told. She took the vessels. She poured the oil. All the vessels were filled. The oil stopped. She tells Elisha. And he says, go and sell the oil. Pay your debt and then what? And you and your sons can what? Live. What she asked for was a means of paying off the creditors, the means of paying her debts. And what does God supply? Not just for her debts, but to live. The means of living, not just paying off the creditors, but ongoing support for her with her sons. As, notice the verbs, go, sell, pay, live. Not just your debts, but so that you might live. Now, somebody might accuse me of allegorizing at this point, not that that's the worst sin in the world, but... You really can't hear the word debts and not think of a picture of the gospel, can you? Forgive us our debts even as we forgive our debtors. Has Christ not paid our debts, the debt we owe because of our sin. The wage of sin is death. Are we not in debt to God? Does not Christ on the cross offer himself as a ransom, buying us out of slavery uh, to which we are bound and shackled uh, because of our debts? And yes, that's that's right. These are messianic miracles. This is a picture of what happens in the gospel. Uh, the woman is a debtor. She has no means of paying the debts. God, through Elisha, provides that which is sufficient for the payments of her debts and not only pays the debts, though as though that were not alone enough. And just pause over that for a moment. Uh, think of the grace involved in the payment of the debt. We are sinners and rightly under condemnation. And our Lord Jesus Christ empties himself, takes the bond, the form of a bond servant, and is obedient unto death, even death upon the cross for our sakes. That's grace enough. But then he goes far beyond that, doing, if we might cite some of the language of Scripture, doing exceeding abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think, not just pardoning our sins, but liberating us from that bondage so that we might live. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, not just that we should be pardoned, but that we should live. In Christ, we are buried with him in baptism and raised up in newness of life. Not just our debts being paid. Listen to the language of the scripture. He who withheld not his only son, will he not with him freely give us all things? 
Romans 8, Philippians 4. Doesn't he supply all of our needs, not just according uh, to the bare necessity, but according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus? Hasn't he, 1 Peter 1.30, given us everything pertaining to life and godliness? Can we not say with the psalmist, in whatever circumstance we may find ourselves in life, my cup runneth over. It takes faith to say that. But I believe that if we have our eyes open and perceive the true nature of things, we will realize that our cup, even in the valley of the shadow of death, runneth over. Jesus said, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Did you learn that uh, children's song, running over, running over, my cup is full and running over? Since the Lord saved me, I'm as happy as can be. My cup is full and running over. That's uh, the message of Elisha's dealing with this widow. It's a lesson about the bounty of God's mercy. All this he does for a widow. For a widow. For an excluded one. For a despised one. For a desperate one. For a needy one. He goes and does exceeding abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. And however low and desperate we may be, to those who cry out to him, we can know for certain that he will do the same as we pray together. O oh Lord, our God, we're grateful for the picture of your bountiful gospel that we have here in this miracle of Elisha. Oh, Lord, we pray that there would not be even a single person that would leave here tonight not knowing of the richness of your grace to us in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.